Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We've got another great Oklahoma gardening show for you today as we take a look at some new cultivars of some old favorites. We talk with the All America Selection Executive Director to learn more about the national program. I share with you some things to be aware of this September and Barbara Brown shows us the proper way to prep our fruits and vegetables. Today I wanted to take a minute and share with you some of the All-America Selection annuals that we have on display here in our demonstration garden. Now you've seen some of these previously mentioned. We mentioned the Big Duck series, the Big Duck Yellow and the Big Duck Gold Marigolds, um, but they're a lot larger and that's something different than what I want to show you today. Those in fact, the Big Duck series are known as African or American uh, Marigolds, which are Tegetes uh, erecta. Now this particular one is a French marigold, which is known as Tegetes petula. So it's a different species of marigold. And as you can see, it's much smaller in stature. The big duck or the African uh, marigolds are usually much larger, whereas the French marigolds are much more petite. But the nice thing about the French marigolds is they tend to really hold up because they're a bushier, sturdier um, plant. They really hold up well, especially in rainy seasons, which we have been experiencing this summer. Now this Superhero Spry, what's really noted for it as being exceptional is the fact that it has so much consistency within each of its flowers. You'll notice that it has a really dark maroon lower petals and then the bright yellow center petals to it. Um, and while it is more of a petite plant than the African marigold, it's gonna give you a lot of bang for your buck in this bushy little plant. So now let's go take a look at some zinnias. Here's one zinnia that we just love to have in the garden and this is called Queenie Lime Orange. And not only does it have a fun name, but it has a fun flower to match as well with this dahlia-like flower that fades from a kind of a limey yellow down to more orangey pink colors. It's almost like an ombre of sunset colors there in this one flower. And it, you can see how large those flowers get also. And as you can see, it is a favorite among the pollinators. In addition to a pollinator garden, it works well and cut flowers with these really long stems that will last up to three weeks. Now this particular zinnia is a zinnia elegans, which is kind of related to some of the traditional old-fashioned zinnias that we used to have in our garden, our grandma's garden. But there's also another zinnia that I want to show you just down the way here. This is a zinnia profusion red zinnia. Now this particular one is a cross between the zinnia elegans and the zinnia angustifolias. So that cross combines and you really get the best of both of those types of zinnias, meaning that you have a more sturdy, um, stout, short, compact plant, um, but also one that is more disease resistant. In fact, it holds up really well to humidity, um, which a lot of times zinnias don't like because of powdery mildew. Now this particular one was noted because it has exceptional red color that does not fade, especially in the heat of the summer as that sun can get really strong on those, uh, the color of the petals. You can see we still have a great color. Also, we still have plenty of buds that are still gonna open up, which is a nice addition as well. Now down the way, we also have a zinnia bicolor red and yellow. Um, it is also in the Perfusion series. So you can see it has a very similar compact habit to the red Perfusion zinnia, but with a little bit different and more appealing flower because of the variability in it. You can see that the center has a nice kind of dark hot pink color to it. Then the tips of the petals are dipped in yellow, making a nice contrast. But as those flowers age, they start to take on more of an apricot, rosy look to them. And so as you see, again, we're still getting new buds that are opening, so you still have that sharp contrast. 
But overall, you can see we have a lot of variability between the colors, creating a nice bouquet of different shades of color. Now, both of these Perfusion Zinnias are a nice addition to the garden because they don't need deadheading and again, disease resistant. So while marigolds and zinnias have been around in the garden for many ages, they aren't the same ones that your grandma might have planted. We always enjoy featuring All America Selections plants that we get to display here at the Botanic Garden at OSU. And over the seasons, you've seen us talk about several of their vegetables and ornamentals. Now, they send those seeds to us to feature as a display garden, but today we want to mention and showcase something else, and that is their executive director. Today we have Diane Blazik, who is with us. She is the executive director of All America Selections, and we're happy to talk to you a little bit about the program today. And I'm happy to talk about it as well. So, <laughs> so you're out of Chicago, so it's, it's, it's exciting to have you here in Oklahoma joining us. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, we're just one of many display gardens that you have partnered with all over the country. Tell us a little bit about some of your other partners that you have. Okay, first of all, don't say just because <laughs> it's a wonderful part of our program. It's a very important part of our program. So we have trials and these trial judges get these entries from all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, no matter where the breeder is located, they can enter our trials. They do a great job trialing them from anywhere from one to three seasons. Okay. And then we present them, you know, like on a silver platter to our display gardens. You guys grow them out. You label them with the variety name and the AS logo. Yes. And then everybody can come see them. All your visitors then know which ones are AAS winners. Right. And so tell us a little bit about that trialing process because we are happy to feature them here. And we know that several of them do well in not only this region, but across the country as well. So what is that process? Exactly. So we have anywhere from 20 to 30 different judges for yeah. each trial site because we have different trials. We okay. have one for vegetables, we have one for annuals, we have one for perennials. So we have a lot of different horticulture professionals who are judging these uh -huh. and they do it totally volunteer. So they don't get paid for anything, <laughs> you know, they're giving us their time. They fill out evaluation forms and only if it performs better than comparison variety which I okay. can explain, then it gets an AAS award. So a comparison variety is like, let's say there's a red petunia in our trial. Mm -hmm. It's trialed next to like an industry favorite or a home gardener favorite red petunia. It has to perform better. Okay. If it's the same, it does not win. Okay. So once they win, then in the next year, we send them out to all of our display gardens where you guys plant them. And yes, we have over 200 display gardens throughout North America. Okay. How many tri uh, trial gardens do you have? Uh, right now, we're up to 90 different trials trials and you know one trial site may do one trial mm -hmm. one trial site may do like all seven because there's seven different categories okay. we also trial in ground and in containers now so oh, we okay. really want to know for the home gardener is this going to do what we've got this new uh, potapino jalapeno uh -huh. and it was uh, made to grow in containers so for everybody who wants to grow on their patios or their balconies you know, we're testing for that now. So I think that's a really important feature of the trials that y'all do because, you know, we're flooded on the market with different options and a lot of times they look very similar, but to actually know that they are performing better um, is critical. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people are trying to grow on their patio. So can you tell us a little bit about some of those other plants that maybe are offered for smaller because uh, not everybody can grow a big garden of tomatoes. Exactly. Yeah. So we actually have a search function on our website for container suitable. Okay. And so all anybody has to do is click on that little function and they'll get all the edibles and the ornamentals that work great in containers. And while we're talking about your website, that's a wealth of information because all of the um, plants that you'll see that are in a display garden are featured on your website with information. Right, right. And every single AAS winner, all 863 of them, have their own web page. Okay. So on the web page, there's all the growing information, the height, the width, the comparisons, what they were grown next to. Yeah, pictures, so you know what it's going to look like. All that is on our website. And so, did this start with just vegetables? Because I know you're 
doing a lot more now. Tell us a little bit about that history. Yeah, in 1932, we actually started with two trials, one for annuals, ornamentals. Um, we call them ornamentals now. They were called annuals or flowers back then, uh -huh. and vegetables, which now we call edibles, just <laughs> to embrace, you know, all the fruits that we were getting in. So, yeah, we started with those two back in 1932, but now we've added um, annuals or ornamentals that are vegetatively propagated uh -huh. as well as perennials. Okay. So we do have a nice selection of perennials and now also. So how do you know what's going to be out there next year? Do you have um, any? I'm totally clueless. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know until I get all the scores in from the judges. And then we do all the math on it and we figure out which ones have scored high enough to become a potential AAS winner. Okay. And so I think we are in the mountain region. So as a display garden, we get certain ones that have one in our region as well. Uh, can you kind of talk about, you know, if somebody lives outside of Oklahoma or in other regions? Sure. Yeah. What we do is when we do this mathematical mm -hmm. equation and look at all the scores, we first look and see if it's a national winner. Okay. So if it has done well everywhere in all six regions, it's a national winner. Um, if it doesn't score enough for a national, then we look at each of the regions and let's say, you know, it did well in three regions or two regions or one. Then we grant it a regional award knowing that the judge in that area said, hey, this one did great. It puts up with our climate. It puts up with our rain. It puts up with our humidity. <laughs> so that's the purpose of the regional winners. Okay, excellent. Well, I think a display garden is a great feature for the consumer to come and find. And, you know, just because it's in the winning category for or a display garden for so many years, there's been some that you've had that have lingered around, right, on the market? Very, very. We actually, you know, I think a lot of people figure that a uh, heirloom is about 50 years old. Well, we have heirloom heirlooms, I think. <laughs> um, we have the winner from 1934 Imperador. Carrot is still available from multiple sites. Um, straight eight cucumber is still available. There's there's fewer flowers that are still available just because there's been so much progression in okay. the breeding work with there. But yeah, it is kind of fun that you can go back and find some really old varieties that were AES winners. And so one of the big questions we want to finish on is if a consumer was to walk through a display garden or a trial garden and really want want to find those plants, how would they go about finding those plants well, for they themselves? Well, they look for our logo, the Little Round logo mm -hmm. with the AAS uh, letters on it, but also on our website, we have links to a lot of online retailers. We probably have about 60 different online retailers, and if they're carrying that particular winner, there will be a link right on our website to okay. go right to their website so you can buy the seeds. All right. Thank you, Diane, so much for all of this information, and we look forward to continuing in this partnership. Thank you. Bagworms, squash bugs, armyworms, what is next? Well, unfortunately, fall brings with it another crop of insects, including the fall webworm that we have here above us in our pecan tree. Now, a lot of times you see fall webworms on some of those nut trees like your pecans, your black walnuts, your hickories, and even persimmon trees. And if you think you're off the hook just because you don't have a nut tree, that is not the case. In fact, webworms can be found on over 88 different species across the U.S. Now, while they are unsightly, um, as they create that web that really houses the colony of caterpillars that are in there, and those caterpillars can be ferocious as they're continually devouring the foliage, they typically are just more of an aesthetic nuisance than they are a detriment to the tree. Um, even though those caterpillars are busy eating the foliage, they really aren't causing too much problem because the tree is in the process of actually shutting down. And a lot of times those leaves will be falling off the trees shortly. However, they do tend to be a problem on pecan production, especially as they can reduce the vigor in pecan trees. Now, if you are wanting to treat your fall webworms, you can use Bacillus thuringiensis, variety Kurstaki, but you want to make sure to really open up that web in order to get that pesticide in there on those caterpillars. Now, if they're easy to reach, you can simply just reach up there and cut those webworms out of the tree as well and therefore get rid of the colony that way. Now the next fall insect to be looking out for is the twig girdler. And the telltale sign of the twig girdler is not necessarily the insect itself, but the twigs that you will often see littering your yard. So what happens is the twig girdler is a long horned boar, and so it will bore in the ends of twigs and, and leave its larva in there. Now in order to create a better habitat for that larva to develop in, it girdles the twig. 
And so you'll see oftentimes the twigs that have fallen, they look like they've been run through a pencil sharpener or simply have been cut off. Now, while it doesn't typically cut the branch off, what happens is in the fall we have more winds and so those weak branches start falling. Now again, the twig girdler often goes after a lot of those nut trees, but you will find it on other trees such as oaks and elms. Again, it's more of an aesthetic problem and a nuisance having all of those twigs to have to mow over than it really is any uh, detriment to your tree. It also can be a problem aesthetically on especially ornamental trees. Now, if you wanna reduce the population, the best way to do that is simply by picking up any of those broken twigs that you find on your yard and removing them because they do overwinter that next year's population of larvae. So by removing those twigs that have fallen, you're getting rid of the larva for next year. And the next thing to keep in mind for September, while it may not feel like it right now, we have made it through the heat of the summer. So our mild temperatures are soon approaching. Now take advantage of those mild temperatures by getting a few last minute cool season short crops in the ground, such as beet, spinach, and lettuce. One of the first places that many of us look these days for information is on social media. We learn it from our friends, from other places, whoever's on social media is giving us information. And not all of it is accurate. So we want to try and zoom in on what the proper way to clean produce is going to be in general. And the first thing I want to mention is that everything that you're going to eat, any kind of produce needs to be washed. If it's something like this, you think, well, why, why would I wash this? If it's an avocado, why would I wash it? I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna eat this part of it, and so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but what happens if you cut into it, if you dig into it with your fingernail, you're gonna be transferring microorganisms to the inside that you are going to eat. So it's really important that you clean everything, whether it's the banana, the orange, the avocado, and so on down the list. The kiwi, whether you're eating the outside of it or not, you need to make sure that it gets clean. Now the way that, that we recommend that you clean them, and it's not just me, it's as in we as in USDA and FDA, uh, recommend clean drinkable water moving drinkable water if possible. So if you can do it under a faucet with cool water, uh, then, then you're gonna be ahead of the game. Uh, the, the special sprays and so on that are out there really are not gonna do anything more than the, the running water and rubbing. So the, depending on what you're using, uh, you may just rub it with your hands. If you've got a brush, that's gonna be your best option. So something like this, you wanna use a brush uh, under running water, rub it, uh, brush it all the way around so that you can get as much of it off. The surface is not flat, even on something like an apple uh, that will look like it's got a flat, smooth surface. This, if you got down to a microscopic level, that would look like uh, the Grand Tetons or the Rocky Mountains. It's all up and down, and so microorganisms can get down in there and hide. So the brush really helps. You'll never get it all off, uh, but you won't get it all off with any of the vegetable sprays or other things that you can do too. Uh, so make sure that you use the brush on them uh, and, and get them clean. The, another question uh, as I'm going through that is, when do I do the wash? Sometimes you'll find things that say, bring everything home, wash it all as soon as you get there, then it's ready to go when you are. Yeah, probably not, because it's gonna have the opportunity to be contaminated again while it's in storage. Plus, if you don't get it really dry, uh, then it's gonna spoil faster because that moisture that's left on the surface is gonna increase the rate at which that spoilage is gonna occur. The, the microorganisms are gonna either grow faster, reproduce faster, however it is they're causing the spoilage, it's gonna happen quicker. So making sure, that if you're going to do that, make sure you dry it really well. And there are some things that you just shouldn't do that to. An apple and an orange, maybe if you've got your, your uh, vegetable bin uh, or your fruit bin cleaned out really well, you could do that. But something like strawberries or grapes, they're going to spoil really fast uh, if you do them. So uh, the strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, those you wash right before you're ready to use them, not as soon as you bring them home from the market. And the next question is, how do I wash some of these others? Uh, and do they need to be washed? Here I have a, a bin full of lettuce. This has on it uh, washed and ready to eat. 
If it says that on the container, you don't need to wash it again. In fact, the probability is that if you wash it again, unless your sink is spotlessly clean, uh, you're going to recontaminate it simply by having it in contact with other things. So uh, keep it this way. If you don't like the taste of it, uh, uh, then you might want to, because some of the, the gases that they incorporate around them are the things that they rinsed them with, you might not appreciate as much. Uh, but again, right before you use it. If you're going to wash them ahead of time, again, they've got to be perfectly dry. So a salad spinner or paper towels, uh, make sure that you get them totally dry. This one, on the other hand, again from the market, does not say anything about being washed and ready to eat. So this one you definitely need to wash. Filling a basin of water, making sure your clean, uh, sink is clean or, or whatever you're using as your basin, your bowl, uh, is perfectly clean. Washing it through several rinses of water. Uh, this one is not running water so much. It's putting it in swishing it around and pulling it back out, uh, letting it drip dry, and then drying it in addition to that. So draining it in a colander, then paper towels or a salad spinner. Now, one of the things that has had some research on it is whether you should use something like vinegar, uh, a mix of vinegar. And there, let me make sure I get the proportions right. It's a half a cup of vinegar and two cups of water. Uh, this is uh, mixed together and then put in a spray bottle, or you can, can dip produce in it. It does reduce microbial load if you let it give it about 10 minutes. If you do it and then eat it right away, the microbial knowledge is not going to be the same. However, because it's vinegar, uh, lemon juice would, could be used as well. But if vinegar is used, it's going to have some vinegary taste. If you're maybe making a salad, it's got vinegar in it, that's OK. Uh, but it can also damage the texture. Uh, so uh, we don't generally recommend it as the best option. The best option is just clean, potable water uh, as the way to go. Grapes, uh, things that are soft, uh, you couldn't use a scrub brush on. You can uh, rinse those under, put them in a colander, and, and run water over them is about your best option there. Uh, with something like a, a cucumber, you can gently use a brush or you can peel. Now, this is something that's an option for many kinds of fruit. Obviously, uh, we're going to wash this first. Uh, if you're going to peel, you wash it anyway, then you peel it, and then you can rinse it again to uh, remove anything as your hand moved around it. You want to make sure that the bacteria that might have been on your clean hand uh, from handling the fruit or a vegetable in the first place doesn't get back on it as you peel it off. So uh, a lot of hand washing, a lot of re-rinsing to make sure that things stay clean. Anything that's tough, like the orange, the apple, the potato, you can scrub. Uh, the lemon, you could scrub. A cantaloupe, all melons need to be scrubbed. We've had instances with salmonella uh, being contaminated on the outside of those. And the issue, again, is when you pull the knife through, you pull the bacteria through. So scrub that before you cut it to make sure that it's, uh, you've added as much safety to it as you can. Something like broccoli, if you harvest it out of your garden, you may be soaking it in salt water in order to pull any worms and, and other bugs out. Um, and that's appropriate, uh, things like cauliflower as well. But if you're going to the market, you're much less apt to find those. And so you don't need to soak it in salt water. Uh, but you do need to make sure that you've run it under uh, cool water uh, and made sure that you get into the, uh, the buds themselves and through here. Uh, and then if you cut it up, you can rinse it again to make sure that it's cleaned uh, again to the, some of those places that you might not have been able to reach. There's a little bit of uh, technique for almost everything that we have with something like a mushroom. Here we can use a damp paper towel. You wouldn't use a sturdy brush, but a damp paper towel can clean that for you uh, so that you get as much of, the, of the, the soil that's on it as well as the microbes on it uh, that might be there. As I said, there's a little bit of, of a technique for almost everything that we wash, but the general rule is make sure your hands are clean, make sure you wash the outside of the produce to get any soil off, and this should be done inside. The temperature of the water should be no more than 10 degrees colder than the, the produce itself. If it's colder than that, then the, the bacteria in the water may be pulled into the produce. So watch that if you're bringing things in fresh out of the garden and you're using water from inside that may be too cold for what you're doing right now. Um, make sure that you get everything clean. Cold running water, whenever possible, scrub brush on anything that can handle it, uh, and then gently clean everything else as close to when you're ready to serve it as possible. Keep your everything that's going to touch the produce clean as well. So if you haven't cleaned that vegetable or fruit bin out for a while, it's a good time to get that done. I hope you'll take these into account as you go through your daily life of preparing vegetables. This is Barbara Brown. Keep your produce clean.
There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Pumpkin season is almost upon us, and next week we take a closer look at where they are grown. We also have a creative raised bed design that repurposes an old product. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>